Hello, everyone, and welcome to IRT informational session uh, 2324. My name is Brittany Zorn. I am the Arts and Sciences Program Specialist in the IRT office, and I'm joined today by my colleague. I'm Leslie Godo Solo. I'm the Education Program Specialist here at the IRT, and we thank you for taking the time to view this uh, webinar with us and learn more about IRT. We are excited to dive into uh, who we are, what we do, and uh, why you might be interested <laughs> today. <clears throat> so here is an overview of the uh, today's agenda. We're gonna talk about why the IRT work matters, why the work that we do matters. I'm gonna give you a little context about who we are and who we serve. Uh, we'll talk about the program benefits and services that you would receive through participating, and we'll conclude by uh, telling you how you can apply. So why should IRT matter to you and to future students? These are some of the reasons. Um, we know that students in our nation's schools are, um, that, that there are more students of color in our, particularly in our public school settings um, than ever before. And those students as well as white students need access to a culturally inclusive curriculum and an informed pedagogy. Um, you may recall that currently there are attacks against critical race theory and attacks against certain books um, that should be used in the classroom or that parents or organizations want used in the classroom. And that really should not be the case. That should be the purview of schools and of teachers. And we should be able to talk critically about past events um, that and current events for that matter. Our students, both BIPOC and white students, need contact with teachers who understand their racial and cultural backgrounds um, and a variety and who are wanting to have critical conversations about all types of issues related to all types of students. And then finally, IRT matters in terms of bringing parity between BIPOC leaders in education and their student ranks. Uh, so we're engaged in that work of recruiting individuals who want to become K through 12 teachers, administrators, counselors, and professors uh, in the humanities, social sciences, math, and education. Because we believe in diversity, we believe in excellence, and we believe that our kids deserve um, to receive a, um, a, um, education worthy of who they are. Mm. <clears throat> and so the disparity between our students and our educational leaders, our educators, is not exclusive to just K through 12, right? This disparity persists uh, even into higher education. So as our K through 12 student population is increasingly getting more diverse in terms of racial and ethnic backgrounds, socioeconomic status, <clears throat> um, nationality, citizenship status, et cetera, all of these uh, I, you know, backgrounds and demographics, our K through 12, I mean, our higher education student populations are similarly um, increasing in diversity. Student populations are similarly increasing in diversity. So more students are able to earn advanced degrees post-secondary education. Um, however, you can see from this chart here that even though there have been some overall advancements in who's able to access a post-secondary education, it's not equal across uh, all racial and ethnic backgrounds. So there are still significant disparities between um, Asian and white students achievement of a, an associate's degree or higher and our black Latino uh, native indigenous Hispanic <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, Pacific Islander native Hawaiian populations. So the need for uh, producing more representative educational leaders, administrators, professors, counselors, researchers, 
across K through 12 and higher education is well documented. And so the work of IRT is ever more important <laughs> as it's ever been. So as we uh, endeavor to bring parity um, amongst students of color and teachers and professors of color, we're engaged in the following mission. And we've been engaged in that mission since 1990. And that is that we um, work to empower talented, underserved and underrepresented future educators to teach and serve as leaders in American education. Because as mentioned earlier, diversity is essential to excellence. Um, and so this is the mission around which we uh, engage our work. Um, and we hope that you'll become a part of that. <clears throat> so through our mission and the um, contemporary context of our national education system, we continue to operate with a commitment to equity. Um, and so here is a short list of the ways, some of the ways in which IRT demonstrates our commitment to delivering an equitable uh, program experience. <clears throat> so we have virtually uh, no limitations on who can apply or successfully participate in the program. By this, I mean there's no age limit, there's no citizenship requirement, uh, there's not an expectation that you are currently enrolled in a degree program of any kind, there is no limit to the number of times which you can apply to the IRT or which you could participate in the IRT. There's no lifetime cap on services received from IRT to you all. <clears throat> and you could uh, live anywhere in the world and participate successfully. So there's no residency requirement either. Uh, we also don't have any uh, fees associated with applying to the program, so the application is completely free, and you never have to pay any money to the IRT in order to benefit from our programs and services. Um, two statistics that uh, we frequently use when highlighting our commitment to equity is the majority of uh, students who identify as either first generation or low income or both. And so you can see from our 2020 cohort, we're at uh, just about 50% and above the number of students who identify as either uh, first generation or low income, which is a nice transition into our 2022 cohort statistics. Yes. So the current cohort that we are working with, 61% um, of them identify as women, cis woman, femme or trans woman, um, while 22% identify as man or male, and then 17% identify as non-binary, transgender, and gender queer. Um, interestingly enough, um, about 69% or two thirds of our students are 24 years old and younger. And then a third of them are 25 years and older. Uh, so there's a nice mix of ages um, in various generations. <clears throat> the takeaway um, from this slide and this next slide is really to demonstrate the range of uh, folks who participate in IRT. You know, we don't specialize in serving traditionally aged students over non-traditionally aged students. We don't specialize in serving, um, you know, one particular gender or ethnic identity group over the other. <clears throat> you know, we really see folks who come from a range of backgrounds and identities apply to the IRT and therefore of folks from a range of identities and backgrounds participate as well. Um, this particular breakdown here is fairly consistent for our cohort demographics over the last 10 years or so, where we have about a third Black or AFAM identified, about a third Hispanic or Latino identified, um, and then the last third is uh, made up of majority Asian identified folks and a blend of other racial and ethnic uh, identifiers. <clears throat> So in terms of um, the number of students who are first gen or low income, um, you'll see those figures here. Um, we have 66 students in the co current cohort who are first gen, 54 students are low income, and 41 of those students are both first gen 
and low income. This is the last a photo from the last time that we were all able to be in person. So um, our 2019 summer workshop cohort, uh, since the advent of COVID-19 in our lives, since the beginning of this pandemic, all of our program has been programming has been delivered virtually and, and through an online model. So we've not gotten to take a group photo like this in a few years, but we wanted to provide a physical representation, uh, you know, a literal snapshot of what an IRT scholar or what our IRT scholars look like. <clears throat> So moving on to the program components, these are the things that you'll be provided with through IRT. Um, I'm going to list them first and then come back and describe each one. Um, there is a recruiter's month. We do sponsor GRE prep. Um, so there's a discount usually um, that we've been able to work out with a particular vendor you will receive an IRT advisor. You will have a statement of purpose advisor. You'll be privy to fee waivers from the consortium schools. You'll also receive, um, um, you'll receive assistance in negotiating um, and deciding where to matriculate. And then of course, there is an IRT alumni network with with uh that you can take full advantage of so in terms of the recruiter the recruiters month we have um approximately 40 institutions that we work with and during the month of july these deans and various liaisons are available to talk to students about their graduate school programs funding opportunities deadlines and other pertinent information related to graduate school. Um, also with the GRE prep, uh, we typically are able to work out some type of discount um, with a vendor so that students, if you have to take the GRE, can take it for a reduced fee. We also provide each student with an IRT advisor. That person will help them clarify their career goals, they will assist them in coming up with a school list of seven to 10 universities within the consortium. They're your point person throughout this experience. Um, and once you've been admitted, they will also help you to negotiate. They'll help you do the pros and cons of each institution. And um, they'll help you come up with the the language to ask for additional funds if say school A and B accepts you, but school B provides you with more money. What kinds of questions can you ask of school A um, that might ensure that, that that offer is as viable as the offer at B school? You also will receive a statement of purpose advisor. This person is going to work with you for eight consecutive weeks and assist you in editing your statements of purpose, your resume or CV, your writing sample if you need one, and other application components such as the diversity statements, um, fellowship statements, or personal statements. The fee waivers, um, are provided by the schools in our consortium. And as stated, you can apply to previously, you can apply to a minimum of seven schools, but as many as 12. And the vast majority of these schools will waive those application fees for you. So you will easily save $1,000 there. Um, we also assist you in negotiating um, and deciding where to matriculate. Um, through a series of conversations that we'll, we'll have and um, help you identify which school is going to be the, the best fit in terms of academics, in terms of mm -hmm. um, place, in terms of uh, mentorship and fellowship support. And then finally, you become a part of a wonderful alumni network of uh, upwards of 2,400 IRT alums who are working in education fields across the country. <clears throat> 
Okay, so this slide details the uh, length of time over which you receive all of those components of our program, uh, all of those program benefits. <laughs> and so um, we have four seasons that we like to uh, talk about. To, we like to capture the IRT program across. So the way we talk about the 10 months that you'll be working with us is in these four uh, seasons. And so the first season is admissions and orientation. This is in May, maybe early June, uh, when you are receiving your invitation to participate in the IRT cohort. So you're receiving your syllabus and your matriculation agreement. You're receiving access to the IRT exclusive Canvas course. Uh, you're um, receiving information about those discounted GRE prep options, which Leslie was just describing. And you're beginning to research your uh, prospective graduate institutions where you intend to apply. And then uh, the next Two seasons are um, character characterized as pre-application because they're the months leading up to December 1st, which is the deadline by which IRT scholars uh, are expected to submit all of their graduate school applications. So in the summer months leading up to December 1st, you are um, meeting with your IRT advisor, you are getting acquainted with the rest of your cohort mates through various um, online webinars and workshops and Zoom meetings with the whole cohort. You're engaging in alumni panels and uh, summer courses led by alumni summer faculty. <clears throat> uh, you are diving deeper into your graduate school program research and you're beginning to compile some of your graduate school application materials. Uh, then come the fall, the majority of your um, graduate school research, so the research about the programs which you intend to which you intend to apply is now concluding. You've had a chance to engage with IRT consortium representatives. You've had a chance to chat with your IRT advisor and with your fellow cohort mates. You've absorbed a lot of information about graduate school generally and how to determine fit. And now you're moving forward with um, really fine tuning and compiling all of the uh, individual application materials that you'll need in order to submit your graduate school applications by December 1st. So the fall is the time when you're working with your statement of purpose advisor, which Leslie was describing in the last slide, you are drafting, refining, uh, finalizing your statements of purpose, your personal history statements, your diversity statements, your writing samples, your resume CVs, and any other supplemental materials that may be required of your graduate school application applications, and uh, you're basically working towards this December 1st deadline, so dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's. Um, the last season of the IRT timeline is the post-application season, so after December 1st, after you submit all of your graduate school applications, and now you've entered the waiting period, the admissions uh, you know, news period, and you're still working with your IRT advisor like you have been from the beginning from May and June, uh, you're having conversations about evaluating and weighing your different offers of admission. Um, you're getting support from IRT for negotiating your funding packages. And ultimately you're working with us through April to make the best matriculation decision uh, for yourself. So this is a list of many of the academic programs that IRT supports. On one side, you see quite a few um, programs in the educational realm. And then on the other side, these are programs from the humanities and the social sciences. Um, so there are tons of fields that are represented here. Hopefully you find the one that you're interested in. If for some reason you do not, please feel free to reach out to us. Mm -hmm. Also note though, that we do not support social work public policy, law, medicine, or business. <clears throat> I think a question we get a lot when, when we share this information is why, right? Why doesn't the IRT serve social work, public policy, law, medicine, or business? And so the short answer to that question is those degree programs often exist within uh, specific schools i.e. the School of Law, the School of Business, uh, the School of um, Public Services, uh, you know, the School of Health and Human Services, the School of uh, Public Policy. 
mm-hmm. social work, exactly. And so our consortium agreements are often limited to the schools of education or the schools of liberal arts and humanities and social sciences, which is why these two buckets of programs are um, within the realm of support for IRT scholars. And further, um, the expertise of individuals in the office are in the education fields in in humanities and social sciences. Um, None of us have social work (laughs) degrees or public policy degrees, law, medicine, or business. Um, And uh, you also can feel free to reach out to us because if you are having trouble identifying Mm -hmm. programs in any of those fields where you can receive support, um, oftentimes we can um, we can push you in the right direction. Exactly right. To build off of the theme from earlier, Leslie's earlier point, which is to reach out <laughs> all the time. Yes. Um, okay, so here is a list of the IRT consortium schools. So these are the 40 plus uh, institutions, graduate institutions, which are... Um, paying members of the IRT consortium. Uh, This list is always ebbing and flowing. People are being, or schools are being added and uh, schools are leaving for various reasons at any time. So an updated list of the IRT consortium uh, schools can always be found on our website. Um, And a a quick caveat here is that um, the fee waivers, which our consortium institutions agree to provide to IRT scholars, are sometimes limited by other institutional requirements. Uh, for example, uh, some institutions will not waive application fees for non-US citizens, and that is regardless of their uh, membership in the IRT consortium. So maybe we have a partnership with the School of Education, however, the university broadly has a policy about not waiving application fees for non-US citizens. And so our contractual agreement does not supersede the university policy. You would be, you would get like very specific information about this once you're participating with the IRT and you would be able to work with your IRT advisor around any concerns, you know, about which institutions would or would not waive um, application fees for any number of reasons. It's a very small number. And in fact, we frequently have um, found workarounds with students and consortium liaisons for these sorts of things. So just important to note that there are some exceptions, but that you would get individualized support from your IRT advisor around working through those exceptions. Excuse me. So please find here um, information about the universities that enrolled um, the largest number of our students from the cohort of 2021. And they include the University of Michigan, Pennsylvania, Brown University, Harvard, uh, NYU, Princeton, Stanford, um, the University of California, Berkeley, Maryland, and the University of Washington um, in Seattle, the five on the bottom all accepted three students per university. Um, This does not represent uh, all of the admissions that our students received, but again, the the top schools that um, accepted the most number of, of students from the cohort are represented here. <clears throat> and just to to clarify a little bit further, um, this is the number of students that matriculated to these institutions. So eight IRT students chose to go to the University of Michigan. Seven IRT scholars, you know, m- made the University of Pennsylvania their matriculation choice. And I just wanted to highlight this because the number of IRT scholars who were accepted to these institutions is higher, right? Like more than six IRT scholars were accepted to Harvard. It was just that only six ended up actually enrolling, you know, accepting Harvard's offer and and enrolling there. Um, So I just wanted to 
make sure that we, you know, that it was clear that the University of Maryland admitted more than three IRT scholars. They admitted, you know, 20 or a dozen or something to that effect. It was just that only three ended up actually choosing that offer as their matriculation decision. Um, okay, so in the spirit of discussing alumni and where they end up going after they participate in the IRT, uh, this is a sampling of uh, some IRT alums from various cohorts. You can see we go all the way back to one of the very first IRT cohorts uh, with my colleague Leslie representing the IRT class of 1991. Um, and she has been working with IRT now for a couple of decades, so a true expert in the building that we are lucky to benefit from. And then uh, you see we've got, you know, a couple of dozen of alums on through from the 1991 cohort up to one of our most recent cohorts, the 2020, co 2020 cohort, excuse me. And so IRT alums have a lot of staying power in uh, the field of education broadly but also more specifically within their individual roles. Um, and we certainly like to think that that's because of the strong foundations <laughs> and uh, professional skills which they cultivated by virtue of participation in the program. So you're interested in applying to IRT. Well, we want you to take the next step and we're gonna tell you how. <laughs> So in terms of the application requirements, we are looking for individuals who are majoring or have majored in the humanities, social sciences, math, computer science, or education fields. Um, we're looking for students who have a GPA of 3.0 or higher as undergraduates and at least a 3.5 or higher uh, in their master's programs. Um, we're looking for individuals who are open and willing to apply to seven to 12 institutions within our consortium first. Um, of course, you may apply outside of the consortium. Um, you're going to be in great shape to do so because of the assistance that IRT will provide you with the seven to 12. Um, but you should also note that you'll be responsible likely responsible for also paying the application fees to schools outside of the consortium. But we can talk about that too. Um, there may be ways around it. And then finally, we are looking for scholars who are seriously considering a career in teaching and counseling, administrating, and or researching in education. And if for some reason you do not meet one or more of these requirements, still reach out to us um, because oftentimes um, there is um, there is there are ways that we can assist you. <clears throat> yes, never uh, assume that you are precluded from participation for any particular reason, even if you don't meet one or more of these bullet points here. We are, always making exceptions for students or, or, or you know, um, stretching the boundaries of the requirements for eligibility uh, in program, IRT program participation. So in the spirit of uh, equity and, um, you know, increasing access, always, always, always reach out to me or Leslie or someone in the office and inquire uh, whether your particular situation um, I would just add, think of it in these terms, and we have this saying, closed <laughs> mouths don't get fed. So you should ask. Um, the, the answer could be no, and it could be yes. In terms of what we're looking for in ideal candidates, we are looking for scholars who have a research background in their field and or a research agenda for graduate studies. Um, so if you're an undergrad and you wanna do a PhD or master's, that you're thinking about some problem or issue that you want to solve, um, that you've been writing papers about or that you've been actively, actively engaging um, and that you want to continue as a graduate student in a PhD program. We are looking for candidates who have strong writing backgrounds. Um, so meaning that you've written a number of research papers, 
um, or senior thesis, an honor thesis, perhaps, a final paper. Um, and for most fields, if you need a a um, a writing sample, it should be in the field to which you're applying. That's in most cases. There are definitely exceptions with education fields, um, but that is something that we would talk through with you. And then there are definitely fields that require that you have an undergraduate degree in the content area. Um, so fields like sociology, for example, and psychology, if you want to pursue masters and PhDs in those, you should have a undergraduate degree in sociology or psychology. Now, there are other fields where you don't necessarily have to have some coursework um, in that particular field. So, for example, higher ed, I'll throw out. Um, you may have education courses, but if you don't, that's okay as well. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about um, where you fit in and what you may need to do in order to prepare for a particular field. Mm -hmm. We also would like to see students have an understanding of theorists in the proposed field of interest. Mm -hmm. um, so who is everyone else quoting? Um, are there certain methodologies or pedagogies that you want to utilize? Um, we want you to have a, a good basic understanding of, of that for your particular field. We also want you to be able to articulate an understanding of social justice and access and equity as it applies to um, your field, whether that be in education and or in the humanities and social sciences. Um, you definitely will need to have an openness to feedback um, in the IRT counseling process um, because you will be getting a great deal of feedback from your IRT advisor and from your statement of purpose advisor. And you really should think of this experience um, as a preparation for the kind of feedback that uh, you will receive in graduate school and hopefully that you are seeking out in graduate school um, because yes, we're wonderful, but we can be even greater. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, we're looking for scholars who are able to meet deadlines and follow through on goal setting. We're not looking for the perfect student, you know, who can meet every single deadline, every single goal, um, because that's impossible for most of us. Um, and so we're willing to work with you in terms of extending deadlines, but we're looking for individuals who understand the importance of deadlines and of goal setting, and that those things are going to help you reach your end goal of getting into graduate school and um, thriving there. <clears throat> I'll just reiterate the last point that Leslie was making, uh, which is this, you know, this question of what if I don't meet one or more of these requirements? The same question and, and emphasis could be applied here. You know, what if I don't have significant research in the fields that I'm hoping to pursue for my PhD? What if I don't have a strong sample, a strong range of major writing projects, you know, that I've uh, executed through my undergraduate degree? What if I've been out of school for 20 years and the writing that I have is out of date? What if I don't have an undergraduate degree or a master's degree in the field that I want to pursue for graduate school, right? In any of these instances, through this whole list and, and through this previous list of requirements, the question of what if I don't quite meet the expectation, we just want to reiterate you know, one more time for the record's sake that 
uh, you should always reach out to us to have a conversation about your specific circumstances. You know, me, Leslie, anyone in the IRT office is more than willing to have a conversation with you, you know, in February, in January or February, as you're like working towards maybe putting your IRT application together or you're on the website and you're reading about requirements and you're thinking of possibly submitting an application to the IRT, like as you're getting into the process. If you want to have a chat about your specific circumstances, like do not hesitate to make contact. We're more than willing to talk through pros and cons of wherever you are at. And, um, you know, as Leslie said, like help you make the right choices for you and your goals and based on your background and experiences. So just wanting to make sure that even though we have, you know, examples of what makes an exemplary or a standout candidate, even though we have some parameters around who's eligible to apply we're also extremely flexible and we'll meet you where you're at. And so you should never feel um, precluded automatically. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so assuming that you've lasted with us this long and you are <laughs> gonna apply, you know, that you do want to apply to the IRT, uh, here are the actual steps to starting an IRT application. So the application is live, you know, it's already online, it's already open. Uh, you could start your application today if you wanted to. Um, an important requirement of the IRT application process is to attend an informational session. Well, congratulations, watching today's recording counts as you attending an informational session. <clears throat> um, so you've checked off that box. Now to actually start the application itself, your very first step is to visit the IRT website and to submit an inquiry form. So we're actually going to give you a demonstration of this right now. Um, so you can see <clears throat> where what the, what the website looks like and where the inquiry form is. So this is the uh, IRT homepage. You could Google IRT Andover or even just Institute for Recruitment of Teachers. Um, and it should bring you to uh, this website here. Although here is the link for anyone who needs it, it's andover.edu slash about slash outreach slash IRT. <clears throat> um, this is our homepage, but where you're gonna go for the inquiry form and the application is to this page right here. So this is our little menu uh, for the whole website. You wanna go to application. Once you click on application, you'll be brought to our um, page with all of the information you need about applying. You can see the application was opened on December 1st. Uh, there is some really important information that we encourage any prospective applicant to read thoroughly. Um, but right here in this second paragraph is the link to the inquiry form. So you click that. And this is what the inquiry form looks like. Uh, filling this, these short, less than 10 questions, let's see, three, six, eight questions, <clears throat> um, is how you receive credentials for logging into the IRT application. You also, by filling out this inquiry form, um, add yourself to our recruitment and admissions listserv, where you'll get updates, email updates from the IRT office about the approaching March, March 1st deadline, you know, you'll get things that are like, oh, we're just a month away or we're two weeks away or, um, you know, certain pieces of your application have not yet been submitted. Don't forget to turn them in. And so even if you're not sure that you're going to submit an application this cycle, fill out an inquiry form, get on the listservs, receive some updates from the office and, uh, uh, you know, you could always opt out of that later on if you decide that uh, you're no longer going to pursue an application at all. But it's worth it for you to not miss out on at least receiving updates from the office. <clears throat> um, so once you fill out this form here and you click submit, you fill out all these required boxes, you will get an email directly to your inbox with login credentials, which is going to be a username, which is going to be the email address that you use right here on this form, and an automatically generated password for the IRT application system. Now, if you don't receive an email automatically, once submitting that form, check your spam and your junk folders to be sure that, uh, you, that it's not getting lost <laughs> in your uh, email. And then every time after you want to 
start the IRT application um, or work on the IRT application, you can come back to the website and use this apply to IRT link to access uh, the application here. So you can see I've already been testing the application myself uh, for my colleagues with my personal um, login information to make sure everything works. That's why that's saved here. And so this is the application homepage. Again, your username is the email address you use with the inquiry form and your password is whatever um, automatically generated password you get in that email once you submit the inquiry form. <laughs> And so once you take those steps, you go to the IRT website, you submit the inquiry form, you receive your email with your credentials, and then you log into the application to get started. Um, a few other components that will it'll be good for you to be aware of that you would need to provide for the application are some basic demographic information, personal information, and academic information. So uh, your educational background, uh, some basic info about who you are, your professional goals. <clears throat> You'll also be asked to upload transcripts from all previous credit earning institutions. Uh, so this means any institution of higher learning where you earned credit towards a degree, we will wanna see a copy of that transcript. Um, you, we will, you'll also be asked to request three recommendations from previous professor or previous or current professors or supervisors. Uh, you'll also be asked to upload a resume or a CV, and you'll be asked to respond to four essay questions. Um, a preview of the essay questions is available on the IRT website, uh, which I will do you the service. So again, this is the application page on the website. You scroll, you've got your inquiry form link here, you've got your application link here, you've got reiteration of your application requirements, eligibility to participate, getting prepared to submit your application. And then here you see there's a set of essays for applicants in the arts and social sciences, essay one, two, three, and four. And then you'll see there are a set of essays for applicants in the education fields, essay one, two, three, and four. So you can start your application, <clears throat> you can start your essays, and um, you know you can do all of this like beginning today. <laughs> like as soon as you've completed this webinar, these things are available to you through the IRT website. Um, one last uh, important note about the IRT, uh, actually applying to the IRT is that we're no longer requiring a virtual interview. This had previously been the last required component of successfully applying to the IRT. And we have decided as of this year to do away with the interview component. <clears throat> and so you only have to submit the online application to be considered. Um, I'd like to add um, as a follow-up to Brittany's comments, um, if you are wanting to apply to um, an education field and the humanities and social sciences field, you should complete both sets of essays. So for example, um, this past year, we had a student who was interested in an MAT in secondary English. Uh, MAT is a master's of arts in teaching. So she wanted to become a high school uh, English teacher, but she was also interested in pursuing the master's PhD in English literature. So you will need to complete both essays if you have a situation like that. If you're unsure, reach out to us. And the reason I uh, moved us back to this slide here as Leslie was elaborating on uh, the essay requirements is because we're gonna do a deep dive into all the components of the IRT application uh, starting in January, late January. So you can see here, uh, this is a series of four webinars in our Inside IRT's Admissions Process webinar series. Uh, these are the dates and the Zoom links for those four webinars. So mark your calendars now uh, for these dates. And if you are planning to submit an IRT application, you will want to try to attend these webinars live or at least um, refer to IRT's YouTube page 
to get the recordings after the fact. And so as Leslie was already, you know, beginning to um, discuss with you all, you know, we're gonna take a deep dive into those essay requirements on webinar two. And we're gonna take a deep dive into who can actually serve as your recommenders uh, for your IRT application in webinar three. And we're gonna take a deep dive into what is it, what is your academic background even mean? What are the components of the application that IRT considers uh, when evaluating an, an applicant's academic background. <clears throat> um, and of course, starting with an overview of our admissions process on the 18th. So mark your calendars for these dates, or at least mark your calendars to go back to the IRT YouTube page and find these recordings if you can't attend them live. Okay, so for additional information, you can um, visit and or email at andover.edu backslash IRT. And of course, Brittany and I both uh, welcome any inquiries that you may have, comments, um, suggestions, um, and uh, the opportunity to chat with you about your graduate school interests. Yeah, and you can find us, uh, the IRT, on all the socials. Uh, so you can see here, we're on Instagram, we are on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we're on LinkedIn at IRT Andover or Institute for Recruitment of Teachers. And um, we have our own blog, which we've been curating for a few years now, uh, which you can visit for alumni highlights and stories, uh, program updates, and other uh, pieces authored by um, our network of partners and alum. And we look forward to seeing your applications come through uh, come March 1st. Yes. Thanks all. Thank you.